um, before I um, uh, briefly introduce the theme and uh, the speakers, um, I will spend a few minutes um, first with an excerpt from The Empathic Civilization, a book by Jeremy Rifkin, uh, who himself quotes from the story of the World, uh, the world War I Christmas Truce uh, by Stanley uh, Wentrop. I hope this is going to set the tone for, for the panel. Uh, the evening of December 24th, 1914, in the Flanders, Belgium, the first world war in history was entering into its fifth month. Millions of soldiers were, bat were batted down in makeshift trenches latticed across the European countryside. In many places, the opposing armies were dug in within 30 to 50 yards of each other and within shouting distance. The conditions were hellish. The bitter cold winter air chilled to the bone. The trenches were waterlogged. Soldiers shared their quarters with rats and vermin. The men slept upright to avoid the muck and sludge of their makeshift arrangements. Dead soldiers littered the no man's land between the opposing forces, the bodies left to rot and decompose within the yards of their still living comrades who were unable to collect them for burial. As dust fell over the battlefield, something extraordinary uh, happened. The Germans began lighting candles on the thousands of small Christmas trees that had been sent to the front to lend some comfort to the men. The German soldiers then began to sing Christmas carols. First silent night, then a stream of other songs followed. The English soldiers on the other side uh, were stunned. On one soldier gazing in disbelief at the enemy lines said the blazed trenches looked like the footlights of a theater. The English soldiers responded with applause, at first tentatively, then with exuberance. They began to sing Christmas carols back to the German foes to equally robust applause. A few men from both sides crawled out of their trenches and began to walk across the no man's land toward each other. Soon hundreds followed. As word spread across the front, thousands of men poured out of their trenches. They shook hands, exchanged cigarettes and cakes, and showed photos of their families. They, they talked about what the, uh, where they hailed from, reminiscent about Christmas's past, and joked about the absurdity of war. The next morning, as the Christmas sun rose over the battlefield of Europe, tens of thousands of men, some estimates put the number as high as 100,000 soldiers, talked quietly with one another. Enemies just 24 hours earlier, they found themselves helping each other bury their dead comrades. More than a few pickup soccer match, matches were reported. Even officers at the front participated, although when the news filtered back to the generals, to the high command in the rear, the generals took a less enthusiastic view of the affair, worried that the truce might undermine military morale. The generals quickly took measures to rein in the troops. The, the surreal Christmas truce, uh, truce ended as abruptly as it had begun. All in all, a small blip in a war that would end in November 8, 1918 with 8.5 8 million military death in the greatest episode of human carnage in the annals of history until that time. For a few short hours, no more than a day, tens of thousands of human beings broke ranks, not only from their commands, but from their allegiances to country to show their common humanity. Thrown together to maim and kill, they courageously stepped outside of their institutional duties to commiserate with one another and to celebrate each other's lives. So I chose this anecdote to uh, begin this panel because it seems to me that it represents the underlying theme, perhaps implicit theme, um, of the panel and more broadly of this whole conference, namely that humans can see themselves uh, in others and others in themselves. That we humans recognize and value our common humanity and that perhaps giving, helping, compassion, altruism, generosity all follows from this. Consider briefly the following findings from psychological and neuroscience research, some of which will be um, also reported to by our speakers later um, in a few minutes. First one, we feel what other feels, a concept that psychologists have often referred to as emotional contagion or catching the emotion of the other. Newborns cry uncontrollably when the newborn next to them starts crying, but also smile and giggle when we smile at them. We consider this a building block of empathy and compassion. When we see another person performing an action, the same areas of the brain that are active when we are performing that action, ourselves also light up, suggesting that we engage spontaneously in a mimicking exercise, a sort of embodiment of the other person's movement. But most importantly, perhaps, when we see another person experiencing pain, the same areas of the brain that are active when we are experiencing the same pain also light up, suggesting that we feel the pain of others. This always makes me think of Clinton's famous word, I feel your pain, that um, are now scientifically validated by neuroscience evidence. 
These findings, which emerged in the last couple of decades, are giving us insights into the profoundly social nature of humans, and for some constitute a challenge. They all say that homo homini lupus, or man is a wolf to man, or to his fellow man. Now to the speakers, more specifically. Although they come from different perspectives and disciplines and focus on different aspects of this question, the three panelists today share the view, I hope they will agree with me, uh, that humans have an extraordinary capacity for an empathic connection to other humans, and not only to humans, it turns out, and that they display an unmatched propensity to help, even when help is costly. At least two of them see this propensity as deeply rooted in human nature, rather than something that socialization practices have to, sh have to shovel into our selfish minds. In other words, they see the roots of our extraordinary sociability as squaring perfectly with evolutionary principles. The first talk, uh, really up to Zale, is uh, by Professor Michael McCulloch, a professor of psychology at the University of Miami and director of the Evolution and Human Behavior Laboratory at that university. <clears throat> he researches the origins and cause of human behavior from an evolutionary biology perspective, uh, with a particular focus on altruism, prosocial behavior, gratitude and generosity, and forgiveness. He has authored countless scientific uh, articles on these themes and several books, among which Beyond Revenge, The Evolution of the Forgiveness Instinct, and The Psychology of Gratitude. Altruism and generosity are often conceived as highly evolved behavioral patterns and have long constituted a puzzle for narrow understandings of evolutionary theory. But having read his work and uh, the work of others, it is my understanding that today Professor McCulloch will make a case that altruism and generosity make sense from an evolutionary perspective um, as well. His talk is entitled, uh, it's titled The Evolution of Generosity. Now we're going to present the three uh, speakers briefly before inviting them to the party. Just in case you were jumping here. Um, our second speaker is uh, James Doty, a professor um, of neurosurgery at Stanford University uh, and a specialist in neuro-oncology. Uh, he's on the board of directors of the Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama Foundation and uh, perhaps most relevant, um, directly relevant for our purposes today, um, James is the founder and director of the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research uh, and Education also at Stanford University. The center aims to foster research on the biological roots of prosocial behavior, as well as uh, support research on the consequences of the Buddhist practices of compassion and meditation on prosocial attitudes and behavior. Um, there's a few more things I want to say about James Doty. Is, uh, remember that I just mentioned how puzzling sometimes uh, altruism is from an evolutionary perspective. And if this is the case, James Doty is one big piece of that puzzle. Let me give you a, a brief personal anecdote. I hope you will forgive me for this. Um, uh, Professor Dotti, as a wealthy man, thanks of, uh, to his acumen in, uh, in investing in medical technology, uh, was and still is engaged in charitable work across um, uh, the globe. Uh, but what propelled him into public attention uh, a few years ago um, with articles from the Wall Street Journal to a, call, a phone call from Oprah, if I understand correctly, uh, is the fact that after losing it all in the, in the dot-com burst, he kept his promise to give a valuable stock he still owned to a charitable fund to um, benefit Tulane and Stanford University. Quite an example of costly helping behavior that we are going to analyze today. Uh, when asked about this, he answered, the, the charities are in charge of getting the money. He said they're not in charge of, help, uh, of helping wealthy donors continue to be wealthy. His talk today is, the altruistic, is going to be titled The Altruistic Brain. <laughs> Last but not least, uh, Professor Verneken. Uh, Felix Verneken is a assistant professor of psychology at Harvard University. Um, recent graduate, he got his PhD only five years ago, um, and has an impressive career. Uh, he got his PhD at the Max Planck Institute uh, for Evolution and Anthropology at the University of Leipzig in Germany. He has won numero, uh, numerous awards, among which uh, the Outstanding Doctoral Dissertation Award by the Society of, um, for Research in Child Development in 2009. His research has been supported, among others, by the Templeton Foundation, which, as you were reminded yesterday, also support, uh, supports this conference. He's author of numerous public publications in both scientific journals and edited books revolving around the development of cooperation and helping behavior uh, in both primates and uh, human infants and children. His talk today is titled Psychological Development of Altruism in Children. Finally, very briefly about the structure of, the, of this panel, uh, each speaker um, has approximately 20 minutes to deliver um, his thoughts to us. We're not taking questions uh, after each talk, but rather wait until the end. 
I had a few questions myself. I let the speakers interrogate each other. Uh, but after getting the conversation going, um, I will open to the audience as we've done this morning. So please jot down your questions and, uh, and be ready for it. With no further delay, let me invite Professor McCulloch for the first talk. I'm happy to be here with you today. Uh, and I hope to make clear by the time I'm done why there's a typo, typo in my uh, title slide. Why do we celebrate Darwin Day but not Aristotle Day or Newton Day or Einstein Day? Uh, the reason why Charles Darwin is so special, special enough to deserve his own day, uh, is because he came up with what the philosopher Dan Dennett has called probably the best idea anyone has ever had. What Darwin discovered was that there is a mindless, goalless, purposeless process that can take physical matter and turn it into complex functional design. Prior to Darwin, all biologists recognized that there was design in the biological world, but the only designers they knew of were other human beings. There was the thought that God was able to do this design work. Uh, but for uh, voraciously curious minds, this failed to provide a permanent satisfying solution. And Darwin was able to provide that solution. What Darwin discovered is that through a process that he came to call natural selection, organisms will come to behave as if they are well designed for the niches that they will reside in. And that the process that creates this is a process of mutation selection and retention of beneficial traits. Genes, which we now know are the stuff that's doing the replicating and the creation of organisms, do one thing well, and that's make replicas of themselves. Um, it's the one and only thing they're really good at doing. And because they do this well, they will come inevitably to build around themselves through mutations complex functional designs that will appear as if those design elements themselves are put together to serve functions, to do jobs for those organisms and those traits. So today what I want to talk about is what we might have on board inside our brains that's well designed by natural selection for providing benefits to other individuals. When uh, Richard Dawkins uh, titled his 76 book, The Selfish Gene, this is the only sense in which he meant to characterize genes as selfish. They will behave as if what they are trying to do is increase their replication success. And the way they do that is by building design elements around themselves, phenotypes, you might call them scientifically, that through a process of positive feedback cause them to increase their replication success. Some of those design elements that they build are design elements for making behavior happen. And in one slide, I'm going to show you how this happens. In a population of genes, um, mutations are always hitting them because replicators, like all of us, aren't perfect. They're going to make mistakes when they build copies of themselves out of matter they draw from their environments into themselves to crank off these Xerox copies. As they make mistakes in replicating, some of those mistakes will generate variable design elements that will have different functions on behavior generation devices, which we call brains. Those differences in how those behavioral mechanisms operate create variability in behavior. And that variability in behavior creates variability in different states of the world. And as those states of the world feed back, they're going to cause differential rates of re reproduction and replication for those gene variants that are responsible for those design elements, which is then going to change the population of genetic variants. That's natural selection in a nutshell as we think about it in contributing to the design of brain mechanisms. This is important for us to understand before we start thinking about what natural selection thinking might have to offer us in thinking about the evolution of uh, benefit delivery mechanisms or cooperation. And this is problematic. In fact, benefit delivery, organisms that might have design elements on board that cause them to deliver benefits to others, has been a problem for natural selection theory since Darwin wrote about this in The Origin of Species. And here's the problem, really. 
If you have a group of organisms that are accustomed to providing benefits to other individuals, it sounds utopian. The problem is that it's an it's a, um, environment that is ripe for the invasion by mutant organisms who will take benefits from all of those cooperators but not provide benefits to others in return. So they're able to take benefits without an evolved inclination to provide them in return. That causes them to reproduce faster than their more cooperative uh, population mates. And therefore, over time, will invade the population and overtake and cause cooperating elements to go extinct. This is the problem for selection thinking about, and evolu all evolutionary thinking, about the evolution of mechanisms for, for generosity. There have been two ways of thinking about this problem that seem to work to everyone's satisfaction to explain why we patently do have mechanisms in our heads for, de for delivering benefits to other individuals. Right? We look around our world, it's clear, we do, despite the fact that it looks like we shouldn't. Uh, there have been two routes that biologists have discovered that can explain how these mechanisms can come to be. The first is what they've come to call altruism. These are mechanisms such, uh, such as the ones that bees have that cause organisms to provide benefits to other individuals because those other individuals have a likelihood of sharing the same genetic elements as the donors because of a very special property of interaction among certain kinds of individuals. Some individuals are relatives of each other. They're genetic relatives. You and I call them aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters. So through an altruistic route of design, natural selection can favor genes that, per, that cause, does, cause organisms to pay costs in order to provide benefits to other individuals, assuming there's a substantially high degree of relatedness between donor and recipient. We call them families. The other route to the evolution of uh, generosity is reciprocity. Uh, natural selection, it has been shown, favors mechanisms that cause you to deliver benefits to others if in so doing you cause those individuals to uh, have a motivation to provide benefits for you in return at a future date. So what I want to do with the little bit of time I have today is illustrate some, of the, these, illustrate some of the more interesting features of these mechanisms and design pathways. The first one, inclusive fitness maximization through kin selection. This is how we get altruistic mechanisms, and this is due to the work of William Hamilton and others who really showed us that when organisms are out there and the genes inside them are trying to maximize fitness, they're not simply interested in making as many possible copies of themselves through sexual reproduction. That's a big part of it. But they also obtain fitness through securing the reproductive fitness of their genetic relatives. So, what uh, Hamilton did was introduce us to the concept of inclusive fitness, which is the proper way of measuring reproductive success in organisms. It is the thing that organisms will come to appear as though they are trying to maximize through the process of natural selection. Not simply their own reproduction, but the reproduction of other individuals who share propensities, uh, who share genetic elements with them through, through uh, common ancestry. So, some devices natural selection builds are going to impose costs on donors, such as sterile casts of bees or ants or wasps. The way natural selection can favor costs, <coughs> costs of these sorts is because the benefits provided to genetic relatives are mo more than payback for the costs that those individuals who are providing the benefits have to suffer. This is what, nat this is what evolutionary biologists mean when they talk about altruism. It's a design pathway for creating behavioral mechanisms that will motivate you to pay costs that you get repaid in inclusive fitness through enhancing the reproductive success of individuals who bear this same gene. Mind you, this is, we're, dis we're discussing things that happened in the past to build the brains we have today. Right? This is why we're generous in part today, because mechanisms in our head evolved in part through this well, now well understood mechanism. Uh, in thinking about altruism through this route, we want to think about the degree of relatedness between individuals because as the relatedness goes up and up, it becomes easier for natural selection to build altruistic mechanisms into donors. As the costs become cheaper, it's easier, and as the benefits to recipients become better, also natural selection will favor altruistic design elements. So we can 
briefly look at how this works in our nifty diagram. This is how we get altruistic mechanisms. We've got our population of genetic <laughs> variants that create variable brain designs. And those brain designs create variability in our motivation to transfer benefits to other individuals in the world, particularly genetic relatives. All right? This is going to lead to differential to effects in the world, particularly differential health of our offspring, survival of our offspring, uh, survival and health of our sisters or brothers' offspring, our second cousins, our third cousins, right on down the line. That's an environmental effect that is going to, while it reduces the donors' rates of replication because they're siphoning off effort into the reproduction of other individuals, they are more than repaid because of the increased reproductive success of their genetic relatives. Okay, I'm thinking of a, an altru, this is one of those riddles uh, like uh, what's, what, what do you call something that walks on four legs uh, as a child, walks on four legs in the spring, uh, two legs during its summer, and then four, uh, three legs in the winter? So this is a riddle like that. Um, I'm thinking of an altruism device, and on average, each of us has one. Do you need another hint? Half of us have two, and the other half don't have any. It's human breasts. It's very clear that the way that, the, that human breasts evolved, starting 310 million years ago was with, this, was, with single, was with a pathway of single gene modifications to glands that ancient therapsids used for uh, covering themselves in um, antioxidants and also for uh, um, uh, uh, immunity. Through, single, through a single path of genetic mutations, each of which imposed costs on the bearer but provided benefits to recipients, first degree relatives, we get higher and higher intensity of natural selection working to create this complex functional design that now allow mammals to provide food using, to their offspring using their own bodies. This is an all, this, when, when biologists talk about altruism, these are the kind of mechanisms that they have in mind. Do we have other kinds of mechanisms up in our heads? Yeah, we do. These are mechanisms that generate preferences. These are why you prefer to provide benefits to your children and your families and their, their, fam their families' families uh, rather than strangers because we have mechanisms that generate those preferences through the process of kin selection. And to say that is not saying anything controversial because every biologist believes this about every other mammal that provides parental care. So what would be extraordinary and utterly exceptional is if humans somehow lacked the same kind of mechanisms built through the altruistic routes that I'm talking about. So we're going to assume that mothers have in their heads mechanisms that make preferential care for offspring happen. But we're also going to assume that fathers do as well. Although with fathers, the activation of these mechanisms is a little bit more complex. Also, what we know about uh, extended family care as our species was, was evolving leads us to believe that maternal grandmothers would be especially well suited to providing these kind of benefits and being motivated to do so because of naturally evolved, naturally selected mechanisms. Finally, we know that siblings have a, a, a pathway of natural selection that causes them to assemble during uh, development mechanisms that cause them to take an interest in the welfare of their siblings. Like all mechanisms that are in the brain, they don't operate spontaneously. They need cues to turn them on. And it's very interesting to think about what happens during development to cause us to develop preferences for genetic relatives. We know for all kinds of mothers, certainly including human mothers, the cues to kinship that are associated with your offspring are very, very easy to come by. We know that the uterine stretch, for example, uh, during childbirth is a signal to other parts of the body to begin the process of milk letdown. So the body uses its own cues associated with childbirth as inputs to other devices to begin to stimulate benefit delivery systems. For mothers, it's easy because their certainty in who their offspring are remains very high throughout life. For fathers, it's a bit trickier because fathers are always under the selection pressure for um, 
making sure that offspring they are going to invest in are in fact their relatives. So the cues they use tend to be resemblance-based cues, either cues that they get through olfactory routes or cues that they get through physical re resemblance or the number of years they co-reside with mothers prior to the offspring's birth. Uh, similarly, there are bound to be cues for kinship for grandmothers, but this is easy for the same reason that it's easy for mothers, particularly for maternal grandmothers. Um, and finally, we know that kinship uh, cues for siblings have to come from early childhood experience. And what my colleague at the University of Miami has discovered is that the way you develop preferences for your own kin uh, siblings' well-being is uh, a function of the number of years you co-reside with them during development. And for older siblings, what's really important is watching your mother breastfeed or provide bottle feeding to a child. Any child that you see your mother providing food to becomes your brother or sister. That's the way the cues seem to work. Again, this is not controversial to biologists who study salmon or chimpanzees or whales. This is all well worked out. It would be truly exceptional if for humans these cues were not assembled in these same ways. We'd have some very serious special explaining to do if humans were exempt from these. And the research suggests that we're not. So that's our first route to the evolution of these benefit delivery systems. The second is reciprocity. Uh, reciprocity is a, is a system that's favored by natural selection uh, by virtue of the fact that if I can create a benefit for you that then causes you down the road to have a motivation to provide a benefit in return for me, then I can be repaid in lifetime reproductive success by having these additional resources at my disposal. So in reciprocity, individual A helps B, and that causes something to happen in B that motivates B down the road to return a benefit to A. Trade and the gains of trade are the classic example of reciprocity. And what's extraordinary about reciprocity is, in fact, how very rare it does look to be uh, zoologically. Humans are uh, prodigious reciprocators. It's not clear how many other species of animal are also good at reciprocity, but we certainly are one of the best. Um, what we now know is that natural selection can favor reciprocity and motivations to engage in reciprocity when the likelihood of re repeat encounters is high, <clears throat> when the costs of providing a benefit are low to donors, and again, when the benefits to, uh, to, benef to beneficiaries is high. So there we've got uh, genes generating variable uh, design for behavioral mechanisms in the brain, leading to variability in your willingness to provide costs to others. Uh, and then this generates variable effects on recipients' willingness to return benefits to you at a later date, which in turn is creating variable rates of replication, then leading to ultimately uh, natural selection for the fixation of these reciprocity mechanisms. Reciprocity with humans gets very interestingly complicated quickly because we're so darn smart. So we can have a donor provide a benefit to a recipient, and, and that can be something that uh, people who are interested in other people's social lives, meddlesome, gossiping, eavesdropping creatures we are, to take an interest in that information because it's useful. One of the real risks of reciprocity is that you're not going to get repaid for the benefit you provide somebody. So in a species of language using, uh, good social memory bearing creatures like us uh, that have uh, lexicons full of words like stingy, generous, trustworthy, uh, dastardly, and so forth, um, there is great benefit to taking in information about donors and recipients' behavior during their interactions and then using that to shape how you want to treat them in the future. So even simple reciprocity can help to explain why we might find uh, donation to others laudable. Because it's information you can use to look through your social network, your own social Rolodex, and target people for reciprocity who are likely to be trustworthy reciprocators. By seeing people who are good donors, you can get some good sense that they're likely to be good reciprocators, and then you can uh, preferentially, preferentially to prefer to use them in your own trade. Reciprocity systems also need their own cues. 
What are the cues that reciprocity systems use to, to motivate us that it's in our interest to share through these mechanisms? Having resources to trade, knowing someone is in good condition to provide return benefits, estimating somebody's likelihood of repaying, their willingness, their ability to repay, their health, their likelihood of being alive long enough to repay. These are all things we're likely to consider. Are audiences present? Because this enables us to capture reputational effects by having others up, around to watch us. Thank you, I will. What about group selection? We hear a lot these days about the possibility that humans are group selected for um, mechanisms that will motivate us to uh, provide benefits to others. The concept of group selection is fine, but most evolutionary biologists avoid it. It's not because they have some distaste for um, uh, revolutionary Russian princes or because they haven't read Habits of the Heart or Bowling Alone. There's a much more deep reason why uh, they tend not to use group selection in their work, and that's because the math tends to be generally unwieldy. Um, furthermore, it's not clear that it explains any biological phenomena that you can't explain using good old-fashioned inclusive fitness principles of the sort that I've been describing today. And I'm not sure that it explains any human behaviors related to generosity that we can't explain using good old uh, inclusive fitness optimizing uh, thinking. It's definitely not required to explain why humans like to live in groups. And I'll just leave it at that. Uh, finally, I'll, there, it means so many, other, so many different things to so many different research groups that I think we've reached a point where scientific progress is, is being impeded by constantly going back to the group selection literature. You can use it if you like. The tools work. In some ways, they're equivalent to inclusive maxim fitness maximization principles. But for some of the reasons I've described, I would encourage you instead not to give up on inclusive fitness maximization when you think about what we might have in our head for motivating generosity. So is that all? Just two things? Altruism for providing benefits to kin and reciprocity? It might not be everything. There are puzzles still to be explained, but a lot of those puzzles can, in fact, ultimately be explained if we dig down and think carefully about hidden benefits. Lactation is an example I'll use. Lots of animals provide, uh, pro provide milk to off non-offspring. We can often find hidden benefits for those to the giver that natural selection would favor, just as we can often find hidden benefits for generosity mo uh, motivating devices that might not be immediately evident. Um, furthermore, we live in an odd society that's very different from the sorts of societies in which these instincts arose. So it's very likely that many of the encounters we have where we seem to be giving without regard for repayment is the product of mechanisms that evolved for life in close-knit societies where most of our interactions would have in fact been repeat encounters with the same people over many generations. So what does this mean for thinking about humans' capacity for generosity? Is this bad news? Is this good news? Should we give up? My personal feeling is that um, all of the generosity we see around us doesn't need to be attributed to these two devices. We do clearly have devices that evolved by natural selection for these, but that doesn't have to exhaust our explanations for all the behaviors that we see around us that clearly are generous. In fact, I think most of the generosity that the world needs right now is precisely the kind of generosity that's not going to be reliably promoted by mechanisms like the kind I've been talking about. As a matter of fact, as I've been doing a bit of reading over the past couple of years, uh, I've come to the conclusion that what's really special about at least the past three or four hundred years in the West with regard to generosity is that generosity has really accelerated, not because we've learned how to hotwire these evolved intuitive generosity devices, but because we've gotten hold of some really good ideas. Uh, one is the action of markets, which have left people with surpluses that enable them to, get, to have the option of giving without taking food out of their own children's mouth. And then secondly, we have, uh, we have educated a literate populace in Western societies who can process written arguments and, think, and read in writing spirited public debate about the value of generosity and about the value of giving out of your plenty. And then finally, we've developed these really good norms and laws and institutions 
that take on the spot deliberation out of decisions to give, either by making it easy to be generous or by making it hard not to be. And I'm thinking about taxes in a case like that. Therefore, though I think we need to better understand how humans evolved benefit delivery devices might be used to make the world a generous place, it's the latter forces that interest me most. These are the ones that I think are the most powerful. The invisible hand, a few good ideas that make us better moral reasoners, and a small set of carrots and sticks. These are the things I think that we need to understand even more deeply and more urgently. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. We are going to go with no delay uh, to our second speaker, Professor James Doty. How are you all? All right. Who is that person? Good. Well, as much as I would like to believe my colleague you see here, um, we have many <laughs> with plenty uh, who uh, somehow think that generosity uh, uh, connotes socialism. Uh, but uh, that being said, we'll, we'll proceed. Um, so my name is Jim Doty. I'm uh, from Stanford, and as was alluded to, I'm actually a neurosurgeon. Um, and some people wonder why a neurosurgeon at Stanford is interested in compassion, since that can be oxymoronic for some people. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it has to do, everybody has a backstory, and uh, uh, it relates to my own, actually. Uh, as a child, it always interested me the paradox between those who have means and position, yet choose not to give, and, uh, or help those suffering, if you will. Or, uh, and then the paradox, of course, of people who have nothing, who are extraordinarily generous. Why, why does that happen? And so this has been sort of a lifelong interest and uh, has uh, resulted in where I'm at today, if you will. And it apparently also resulted in me uh, giving away $30 million when I was bankrupt. Uh, my wife, uh, she said in this article that was alluded to, she said, uh, I don't mind him being generous, I just didn't want him to give everything away. <laughs> That's the way wives are, though. Um, so our center at Stanford is really a secular uh, center, uh, although it was alluded to that we have an interest in Buddhism, it's really an interest in meditative practices, many of which are associated with Buddhism and other uh, uh, contemplative practices. Uh, this is a secular organization, it's multidisciplinary, it's within the Neuroscience Institute, and we have really three goals. One is research, really understanding the neuroscientific and psychological underpinnings of, of compassion and altruism, and the other uh, is interventions and uh, dissemination of that information. So the things I'm going to talk about today, in some ways were uh, spoken a bit about uh, by my colleague, uh, but we're going to go a little bit further and fairly quickly because I'm going to run out of time, of course. But one of these is these aspects of pro-social behavior, nurturing, empathy, compassion, and altruism. And as Michael uh, commented on, uh, you know, Darwin, of course, uh, has been quoted numerous times. And one of his quotes, which you see above, is sympathy has been increased through natural selection for those communities which included the greatest number of the most sympathetic members would flourish best and rear the greatest number of offspring. Now, I use the term we evolved uh, to nurture. And in fact, if you look at essentially all mammals, and certainly beginning with primates onto man, we have continually developed this process where to, if you will, enlarge our cortex and develop uh, abstract thinking, a large working memory, uh, complex communication, and if you will, theory of mind, it has required a prolongation of the gestational period and this vulnerability of offspring that lasts for years and years after delivery without bonding mechanisms, profoundly deep, strong bonding mechanisms, whereby the mother would stay with the infant, time would be spent to nurture this child, we would not survive as a species and have uh, uh, the abilities that we have today. 
Uh, empathy is an important aspect of this. The ability to walk in another's shoes, to look at another person in regard to theory of mind, and experience what they're experiencing in the context of obviously a mother to the child, that's incredibly important so she knows that the child is suffering. In, term, in the context of learning, a child has to mirror the caretaker's behavior to grow and expand its own, uh, if you will, emotional vocabulary. Um, and this is in the context of uh, what we've all heard about, mirror neurons, uh, the ability to rapidly interpret, if you will, micro expressions. And these areas that we associate with empathy are found in the anterior insula and the uh, anterior cingulate. And if you look at the evolutionary aspects here, we see these two systems uh, of empathy. One is, if we will, emotional empathy, and the other is cognitive empathy. And again, these are expans expansions of this evolutionary uh, process, whereby you have what was spoken by, by Michael, emotional contagion, personal distress, the sympathetic concerns. And these are the more primitive uh, aspects of the development of emotion and empathy. And these are found in rodents and birds. And also, if we talk about ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, we also see, of course, as we go to the next step in the more advanced in chimpanzees and other primates, uh, this concept of cognitive empathy. And here, in the context of the brain, we see these areas of empathic understanding light up on functional magnetic resonance imaging, as we see that these areas of perspective taking in regard to interacting with another uh, show increased metabolism in these areas. And again, uh, this concept of empathic sharing, uh, we see these uh, areas again uh, light up that are associated with taking on the feelings of another and experiencing their emotion. Now, if we switch over and we think about the process, what happens when we engage with another? We have a choice in that initial interaction, don't we? I mean, we can either engage or not engage. What stops us from engaging is this activation of our reptilian brain, if you will, where we feel distress, disgust, or fear, and we withdraw, or we choose to engage. When we engage, then, is this is when these empath empathic centers uh, respond, because we are actually looking at another person, experiencing what they're feeling, trying to put ourselves in their shoes and then deciding it's worthwhile to engage. And once you do that, where you take on this, if you will, suffering or a concern, and it doesn't necessarily have to be just suffering, you can actually have empathic joy, but in the context of what we're talking about today, suffering. Um, then the next step is what do you do with that? And the term generosity has been used. Uh, there's a lot of overlap here, I think, compassion. Now, when we use the term compassion, we talk about the recognition of another's suffering and a desire to alleviate that suffering. And then the transition, if you will, to altruism is actually an act. And as uh, we talked about, this act of caring for another in need of suffering, this concept of altruism, there's usually associated with this, this idea that there's a cost to the giver in some way or another such that there's no return benefit expected. But a lot of people would argue that, in fact, it's impossible to have, if you will, true altruism because, of course, the person who gives knows that he gives, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but there's significant benefit to another in terms of the context of, of society, where there's this, people recognize that that person is a giver, but also, uh, uh, in the context of just the person themselves, where they f have a good feeling associated with this giving. So to be able to remove that, I think, probably is almost impossible unless a person were to give anonymously, and that money was then sp spent for a cause of which he had no relationship, nor knew the outcome, except that it was done for some good. Maybe that's an example of true altruism, but I don't think we see many people who give money in that fashion, actually. And then we talked about kin selection, close kin versus distant, vested interest, which really wasn't talked about, but I'll talk about a little bit 
and this idea of uh, reciprocal altruism. You know, kin selection, of course, as Michael spoke about, is this concept that the closer the kin, the more desire you have to care for them. And there's a whole variety of evolutionary reasons why that is the case. And of course, as this kin relationship becomes more and more distant, this desire to be involved becomes less and less. And then, of course, this idea of reciprocal altruism, where you think that in the future this relationship is going to somehow benefit you. And as Michael put into the context of social interaction in our society, where there's an announcement that somebody has done something, or simply in regard to trade, where it may be a, a situation where at this point in time you need, but you also know uh, that in the next situation somebody else may need, and you're going to be around and they're going to be around. And you don't want to uh, compromise that relationship because it will cost you. And then this translates into a lot of the work that's been done, and there's now a subspecialty of, called neuroeconomy, uh, in which economists use money to understand why people behave in certain ways, and this translates into a lot of work called, uh, associated with game theory and what's called the prisoner's dilemma, where they set up these artificial constructs, and then they see how people respond, if you will, just giving, and then how others respond if they have the ability to take and not give, and ultimately we see that uh, oftentimes the group, if you will, will ultimately punish them, indicating that there is a innate desire to see, if you will, fairness, and also at the same time, this continued concept of a desire to care for others. Now, there has been, when we talk about compassion and altruism, obviously, as was alluded to, uh, it's all in the genes. There are some uh, individuals who state, and whether it's happiness, whether it's altruism, whether it's compassion, that about 50% of the effects that we see or the activities of individuals are inherited, and uh, the other half is culturally or society or environmentally oriented. And in fact, a couple examples. You've all probably heard about the oxytocin gene, right? This is called the bonding or the nurturing uh, gene. And there have been studies, and this is with the prairie voles. I don't know if you've heard of these studies where these prairie voles, there's a monogamous set and there's a promiscuous set. And the promiscuous set has an alteration in their oxytocin gene, and this is the explanation why one group is monogamous and the other group is quite promiscuous. And in fact, it probably explains people's behavior in this room. <laughs> but uh, uh, <laughs> there, <are> some <laughs> there is some, though, uh, feeling that uh, that is too simple of an explanation. It may be much more complex than that. And I think we see with other uh, uh, genetic defects, if you will, or variations, uh, one is this what is called uh, catechol all methyl transferase, where the single uh, nucleotide polymorphism also is associated with individuals not being altruistic or compassionate, if you will. And in fact, uh, in, in uh, individuals with borderline personalities disorders, we can see these effects. And so at some level, ultimately, while we see hyper generous people, we also see people who, if you will, lack empathy or compassion or the ability to respond to another suffering, is it in part uh, related to people's genetic expression. And in fact, if you even take it to the furthest level, is it potentially, as an example, a sociopath who has the inability to uh, have these complex feelings to be able to not, he sees suffering, but he does not process it the same way you and I do, and doesn't intervene and has absolutely no impact on him. There's now a body of evidence that says you can even identify these people at a young age, even as, as young as four or five. And in fact, if you continue to take this out, this leads to this huge social question of, are these people really responsible at the end of the day? Uh, then there's another uh, theory that has uh, gained some popularity that people who have autism spectrum disorder, we talk about 
their inability to connect, but some people have even postulated that this is a genetic aberration whereby it's not so much that they don't have the ability to connect, that in fact they have hypersensitivity to em empathy and in fact are so overwhelmed by it that they go into their own world. So this is still all being sorted out, but this is just to give you an idea of the complexity of this concept of compassion, altruism, and generosity. But hopefully, I'm gonna give you some reasons why there is benefit to being altruistic and generous. And this is uh, the study associated with the uh, oxytocin receptor subtype uh, abnormality. And, uh, uh, and then uh, this is a study that was done where we talk about empathy, we talk about connection, we talk about nurturing, but there's also a price to pay when you don't have social connection. If I can. Uh, and this is an example of what happens or what we know about when people who are not cared for, who are, do not receive empathy, do not receive concern, as an example, from a parent. You look at this huge number of health conditions that have been associated with poor nurturing or bonding, and then also these, these, uh, this concept of an anxious or avoiding type of personality, again, associated with this lack of connecting with another. But uh, let's talk about compassion and altruism, if you will. There are a number of studies now that show that if we take this to the next step where we have empathy, where we've taken on the, the concerns or suffering of another, and then you become compassionate in the sense that you want to see somebody's pain relieved, what happens next? Altruism actually, or kindness, is the intervention. What we see happens is that those same centers that are associated with reward in the brain, uh, and typically reward in the con or pleasure, and this is associated with food or sex, actually, when you were kind and generous or altruistic, these same centers, uh, these reward centers, activate, and uh, we see this with certain types of charitable giving and with, uh, uh, if you will, uh, even the desire to relieve the suffering of another. Here's a study that was done by my colleague, Dr. How Harbaugh at University of Oregon, and this was a study in regard to a neuroeconomic study where individuals were given money that they could give to charity. And in fact, when they gave, their reward centers lighted up, lit up. But in fact, what also happened, when they did not even have a choice about giving, giving, but it arbitrarily decided that they were going to give, those same centers still activated. So in fact, the process of <coughs> giving, or even if you have nothing to do with it, actually results in your reward centers being activated. And then uh, I mentioned this in-group, out-group. This is one of the challenges, though, of caring for others. When we talk about um, kin selection, when we talk about reciprocity, but how do you deal in the situation of in-group versus out-group? And what I mean by this is we know and we talked about the evolution of the species, we know that this evolved from this uh, nuclear family initially, then it expanded to, the, if you will, the hunter-gatherer tribe, but there it stops. And in fact, there's a study that shows that if you give oxytocin intranasally, it results in you having this significant feeling of, of, con uh, of, of caring and concern for others. But what happens, though, is it actually stops once it goes outside of what you define as your in-group, which are typically either people related to you or who you perceive as sharing the same values. So, so in this example, if I can, uh, we see this activation in individuals on the top where when they see another receive pain who they, if you will, define as their in-group, 
they have the significant <coughs> response and feel it greatly. But on the bottom is a study that was, uh, I can't remember who it was done by, <coughs> but this was an example where the people were given different examples, and this was in the context of people who had uh, 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 gotten AIDS. And then the one example said, how do you feel about this person who got AIDS <coughs> through a transfusion versus somebody who was involved in promiscuous sexual behavior, a homosexual? And what happened is that they did not feel as empathetic or caring or concerned about the people who they felt, if you will, were outside of their moral framework uh, and outgroup. And, and we can talk, and I'm going to talk briefly about how we might be able to overcome that. So we've seen that with, if you will, compassion, altruism, caring for another, it activates these reward areas in the brain. And we also have heard that half of this is genetic, but I would submit to you then that maybe most of us don't actually receive all the benefit of being compassionate in terms of health. And in fact, can we actually potentiate our own compassion? And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. As an example, uh, this is a study that was done, two studies, and by a training, if you will, a compassion practice, uh, we saw the positive benefits of being compassionate uh, in the context of effect on your immune system and decreased markers for stress. In the bottom, this was uh, a, a study using a compassion cultivation uh, training that we developed at Stanford, and in this subset of patients, we saw that they, with just this type of training, these individuals uh, felt that they could cope much better and, uh, and they are much more likely to help others. Uh, and then we can see here, there are now a variety of interventions that have been done to increase compassion for self and others. And we are seeing more and more of these studies resulting in uh, positive benefit from compassionate behavior. And in fact, there's a study uh, that was done. There's a study that was done with volunteers. And this shows you, some, again, some of the limitations of, if you will, being altruistic and compassionate and actually respond to one of the statements Michael said, which is interesting. This was a group of people who had been followed since high school, and it related to volunteerism, which is in some ways being altruistic. And this was for the individuals over the age of 65. If you volunteered in an activity to help others at a certain amount of time that you gave, it actually, compared to the control group who did not, your longevity was twice as much as the other group with one exception. If you did it with the sincere intent and a desire to help others, you receive that benefit of increased longevity and some of these other <coughs> positive benefits. If you only did it though for, as an example, because you wanted others to see that you do this or you were doing it because your friends were doing it, you did not receive that benefit at all. Uh, so it's an interesting thing. It has to be authentic connection. Now, some of the challenges to being kind and altruistic or generous, if you will, you know, when you're overwhelmed with suffering, you can shut down. Uh, uh, and, you know, burnout and is often associated with physicians. Dehumanization, Phil Zimbardo's written this book on uh, the Lucifer effect, where regular people with all the attributes of civil society, like sitting here, under the right circumstances, you can become a horribly evil person. But the other side of that coin is, again, with training in the right circumstances, you can be an incredibly generous person and receive all the benefits in terms of health uh, from actually being more compassionate. So in conclusion, it is really the survival of the kindest. And uh, the more you think of others, the happier you are. And I think that sums it up, uh, and that's from uh, my friend, uh, the Dalai Lama. Thank you. OK, thank you, Professor Dori, for this presentation. Uh, we're next and last speaker um, is Phyllis Verneken, and the title of your talk is? We'll see it in a second.
<laughs> okay, this is the title, it's slightly different now. Yes. Um, yeah, first of all, I wanna, wanna thank, um, for the, thank Arian for putting this together and for the opportunity to present uh, our, our ongoing work. And I also wanna um, thank the first two speakers, uh, Michael, and James, because they very well introduced the topic, so it can be very brief in, in my introduction uh, here. Um, so what I want to talk about is about uh, children and chimpanzees and what we can gain from studying these uh, different species to find something out about um, altruism more, more generally speaking. And as was alluded to earlier, uh, cooperation um, broadly construed um, in terms of costs and benefits of um, social interactions are actually uh, widespread in the uh, animal uh, kingdom, both in <laughs> forms of mutualistic um, interactions, but also in form of altruistic acts where one donor, for example, is um, performing something that is costly for that individual uh, and beneficial to another one. So um, this can be seen in cleaner fish interacting mutualistically with each other, use social insects uh, or cooperative breeders who as the name says it, uh, cooperate in, in breeding their, their offspring. And so one important question, as Michael pointed out, is that about ultimate function. So how is it possible that these kinds of behaviors can evolve through natural selection? So that it must be some direct or complex indirect benefit to the individual who engages in these cooperative uh, acts. And, um, what I want to point out, and this is what both of you have already pointed out as well, is that in addition, we really have to understand the proximate mechanisms that enable these behaviors in the first place. So this would be um, something um, that are the motivations, um, the cognitive and motivational and also behavioral processes that underlie these cooperative and in some cases altruistic behaviors. And, and this seems particularly important when we look at humans because when you think about it, we engage in a variety of, of cooperative behaviors where we feed, sorry, this is not shown yet, uh, where we feed others, uh, where we donate money, where we help each other out, where we rescues, uh, rescue others and, and so forth. So even though we see a lot of cooperation going on in the animal kingdom, where we seem to be special at least is the variety in which we cooperate, cooperate with other, others and uh, the ways we uh, act altruistically. And so what I want to submit here is that it's very important to look at the social, in particular, social cognitive capacities that enable us to engage in these various forms uh, of, of altruistic behavior. And I want to break it down. There's variety, but we can organize it, I think, in, uh, to three classes. So that would be comforting behaviors um, that are defined by someone detecting, recognizing a negative affect in another individual and is somehow driven to alleviate that, um, like James uh, po pointed out. And then another class of behaviors are sharing behaviors where the problem is a different one. An individual is lacking a resource and the altruist is providing that resource to this other individual. And a third class are helping behaviors in which there is not so much uh, some emotional problem, some effective uh, uh, problem or that someone's lacking a resource, but that there's a concrete action goal that cannot be achieved without the help by another individual. And this is what I wanna focus on here today and present you a series of studies that has investigated this phenomenon. So let me zero in on that a little bit more. So I think that helping or what we call instrumental helping is a very interesting phenomenon because when you have a situation in which a person is trying but failing to achieve a goal, you can test to what extent other individuals have the capacity to, in the first place, recognize that there is a problem. So a competent helper has to have the cognitive understanding of the other person's individual goal that cannot be achieved. Um, and therefore we can learn something about the social cognitive processes that are going on. And then the second thing is, this is not sufficient, you also have to have the motivation to act on behalf of the other person's unfulfilled goal. So, and in some circumstances, this might be altruistic, so that you do that um, for the other to fulfill her goal rather than an immediate benefit for yourself. Okay, so what I will talk about today are these instrumental helping situations that can give us insight into the social cognition and, and the underlying potentially altruistic motivation that humans uh, display, okay? 
And so this is just one case study for the general um, topic of altruism. So let me broaden it a, a little bit um, first. So, so the overall question that I think we can address by looking at the case study of instrumental helping is um, about the origins of human altruism, both in ontogeny, so our individual lifespan, as well as phylogeny, so um, the, the evolution of our, our species. Um, and what people have proposed very often concerning um, phylogeny is that um, these altruistic behaviors are based upon a human-specific psychology. So in particular, even our closest evolutionary relatives, according to several models, are only selfishly motivated. They care only about themselves. They do not care about uh, others. And so only humans develop uh, altruistic motivation, and very often this comes in a certain flavor that people th say that these uh, altruistic motivations arise from our cultural practices. So the idea being that um, uh, we learn to be altruistic from other members of our culture through mechanisms such as internalization of norms um, and uh, moral education, that we are being rewarded for being helpful, that we have internalized the norms of others and, and so forth. So the idea behind that is, or the prediction actually, that uh, arises from this is that cooperative behaviors on altruistic behaviors in particular, um, we find only in humans because only humans have these cultural practices to enforce norms uh, and enforce altruistic behaviors uh, on others through internalization of our cultural norms, okay? Um, then very, when it comes to ontogeny, very often the claim is made that children start out as being rather selfish uh, beings who care, care only about um, themselves, and then gradually through these socialization practices, they in addition develop uh, altruistic motivations that sometimes might take uh, into adolescence um, to really understand the, the cultural norms and um, make them part of yourself. Um, and so that these cultural norms play an important role for cooperative behaviors and altruism, there's no question about that. Um, and many studies have shown that. However, most of these studies have been done with adults and school-aged children who have already gone through a long socialization history. And so that they uh, show it is important, but it does not tell us what the actual origin is of the altruistic behavior. So um, as an alternative to the idea that um, socialization practices, and I mean in particular internalization of uh, altruistic norms, are the origin of these kinds of, of behaviors, is that maybe we have this predisposition to engage in altruistic behaviors that we might find early in life, okay? So with regard to the overall question about um, the origins of these altruistic motivations and behaviors, I want to propose the hypothesis that human socialization practices are important, however, they build upon a biological predisposition that is older than socialization practices. And what I want to present here are experiments with uh, young children to look at the origins of this in ontogeny, and I want to complement that with studies with um, chimpanzees. Why chimpanzees? The reason is that chimpanzees are one of the two closest evolutionary relatives, and by looking at these, by conducting these comparative studies, we can find out what the last common ancestor might have looked like. So if we find a behavior that spreads across chimpanzees and humans and maybe also bonobos, we can, by analogy, think that this is something that uh, our, our common, last common ancestor already possessed around six million years ago. If, however, it's a behavior that is exp expressed only in, in humans, um, then this, this would be something that is obviously um, um, un unique to us and might have a more recent evolutionary origin, such as internalization of cultural norms, something that we do not find in other animals. Okay. So let me start uh, by talking about a few studies uh, on helping in children. So I showed you this before, so the main question is to look at both the cognitive capacities that children might have uh, and the motivation they have to engage in um, helping behaviors. And what we did in the first study was we tested 18-month-olds, 18-month-old children because they have not gone through a long socialization practice yet, so they have not internalized uh, moral norms, at least of a 
conceptual uh, nature, but we know from other studies that they're already able to infer goal-directed action. So they have the ability to read uh, goals, so they, when they see someone um, manipulating a novel kind of device, um, but the person is failing to, to do that, um, so it's indicating that something went wrong, they will <coughs> not copy that behavior. But if, however, the person was doing that very, with more self-confidence, indicating that maybe this was actually how he wanted to manipulate the novel object, they copy that behavior. So the, the, these 18-month-old children, actually slightly younger ones as well, they are able to differentiate between what is a failed attempt and what is a purposeful act, okay? And so we um, tested 18-month-old children in 10 different helping situations. In all of these situations, there was a, a, an adult performing an action and then in some situations um, was unable to achieve a goal. So these were the actual mental conditions and I will show you several examples of that where um, all, consistently the person was trying but failing to achieve a goal and this was contrasted with control conditions in which there was no problem and therefore no help was needed. And because we were interested in their spontaneous motivation to help, we um, never praised them or rewarded them for the helping. So here's a first example. So what you will see on a split screen is me standing over there um, hanging towels on the clothesline and then accidentally dropping a clothespin on the floor. And um, so what we see here, this is an extra mental condition that children in this task and several other tasks with out of reach objects would frequently go up and, and help the person give the object to him. Um, however, they would not do that in a corresponding control condition, in which, for example, in this task, I would stand there and throw clothespins on the floor on purpose and not reach for it. So this con controls for the possibility that children would just use this as an opportunity to interact with me, or they think it's fun that clothespins fly through the air and give it to me to say, like, do that again and so forth. So this is not what, what's happening. So it seems like maybe children really do that in order to facilitate my goal achievement. Because we were interested, as I said, in their flexibility of reading different kinds of goals, we had different kinds of, of um, goals that were not achieved. And here's another example. So now the problem is a physical obstacle. So what children see is that I have a stack, uh, I open the doors of a cabinet, put a stack of magazines inside, close the doors, go to the other end of the room to get another stack, and then I return. And again, we find that these 18-month-olds do that in the experimental condition, as you saw, but they do, don't do it in the control condition in which first I put magazines on top of the cabinet, close the door, get another stack, and now I return and once again bump into the doors, but now not because I was trying to put it inside, but because I had trouble putting it on top. And in this case, children do not open the doors. So this controls for the possibility that children were just reminded of how much fun it is to open doors. If this would have been um, their motivation, they should have done that in the control condition, and that was not the case. So once again, it seems like they're doing that when the other person has having a problem uh, and not when the other one does not have a problem. Um, with these kinds of situations, it was always the case that the children could see the um, goal fulfillment previously, so they could see how the person succeeded. And so what we wanted to know next was to what extent maybe children are even able to infer what the person was trying to do, even though they never saw the actual completion. So this is what we did here. So you, the children see me sitting down and doing that. And again, um, the children would show this behavior in the extra mental condition, but not in the control condition, in which there was also the stack of books, but the other books were just around it, and not, I was not trying to put it on top. So it was not the case that children just think it's fun to build book towers. It seems like it has something to do with the goal. Um, okay, so, so these are, uh, shows quite some flexibility, but what you could still argue with these kinds of behaviors is that they have seen this before. So it might be that um, children have actually done that before and been rewarded, or at least they've seen how other people have helped um, someone stacking books and so, so forth. And so to go around that problem, we uh, created a new device that children could not potentially have seen and wanted to see to what extent it would help in that novel situation. So what we did was we had a box that had a hole on top and a flap on the side, and another experimenter first showed the child 
the flap and the child took out a toy out of it so we knew that the, they, they could handle that. Um, and then later, I come into the room at a few minutes later after some other things were done and I have a cup of tea with the spoon and I place the, sp the cup of tea on top of the box and then this happens. And so this is what we see in the experimental condition, um, but in the control condition in which I throw the spoon through the hole on purpose and don't reach for it, the children don't take it out. So it's not the case that they don't think like spoons don't belong in this box or they, I just learned how to open it, so let me do this again. So it seems like it's targeted towards um, the unfulfilled goal of the experimenter. So we were quite impressed to see <coughs> that children were so flexible in their helping. So in each of these categories, you, you find that they help um, at, uh, at least uh, uh, once. And uh, also, uh, when we look at it inter-individually, so 90% of the children that we tested uh, helped at least once. So, so this is something that shows the flexibility, but also the uh, individual spread of, of that behavior. So um, one thing that you might wonder about is to what extent um, children are maybe following some kind of command. So, so this is what a lot of people have pointed out, that even though uh, I'm not directly telling the child to help, it might be that for, in particular when I'm reaching for an out of reach object, it's almost like a, a communicative message, give me that. So it might be that children are not actually spontaneously intervening, it's they're following a, a request, okay? And so this is why we set up a different kind of situation, like the following. So the child is over here on the left playing with the fun toy, and the experimenter is cleaning up stuff over here. These are two tables. Um, and what happens is that in, one con uh, in, in both conditions, both experimental control condition, while the experimenter is fiddling around over there, uh, a can rolls off the table and drops on the ground, and she doesn't notice it. So therefore, the experimenter never made any explicit communicative or behavioral cue about the problem. And we wanted to know whether children will infer from this situation alone that um, this is something that she did not want to happen and therefore requires uh, intervention, right? And so the way we set it up was that in the experimental condition, previously the experimenter had indicated that she wanted the, the cans to be on the on the tables so that you can put them away. And in the control condition, we had different ones. And for example, she discarded some of the uh, cans on purpose or some things dropped on the ground uh, accidentally but she didn't care about it and so forth. But the critical point was that in the test phase, it was always the same for all. And um, the experimenter was just engaged over here, did not notice the accident, and so children had to rely on their memory and the situational cues to infer whether um, help was needed or not. And so uh, what this tells us is something about their cognitive ability to read the goals based upon situational cues and also something about their motivation. Are they truly pro-socially and proactively motivated to help even without any direct or indirect solicitation from the beneficiary? And what we found was a nice developmental increase in this tendency. So the two, two and on average 22 uh, month olds would not um, show a significant difference between experimental and control condition, but then you see the steep increase where then around two years of age, um, children reliably differentiate between experimental and control uh, condition, and they sometimes do not only show this behavior of picking up the object and giving it to the person, but it was often, and this is shown in gray here, combining it with informing the other about the problem. So they would first say like, your can fell, or again. And then, um, the, because the experimenter never responded, then they would get up and um, give it to her. So this shows that um, children have um, several abilities at their disposal um, to engage in these helping behaviors. And you, thank you. Um, and they, they, um, they, they inter, uh, intervene flexibly, at least around um, um, 25 uh, months of age, okay? So what this shows us is that um, these behaviors uh, arise very uh, early uh, in ontogeny, and I showed you um, one example, and this has been replicated many, many times. This, there are actually two more studies are coming out now that um, show the basic uh, results. So, so this is a, a very um, uh, um, 
robust uh, finding that is going on. And so um, what I wanted to um, show you next is um, that we showed, find these behaviors not only in, in young children, but to some extent, they are also present in, in chimpanzees. And so here is one example. So this is the same basic phenomenon like the clothespin task. Right. And so what we found was that um, chimpanzees would show these instrumental helping behaviors um, even though the person was never rewarding them for helping or punishing them for not helping, and which was very surprising to us. And they, like the 18-month-old, differentiated between situations in which this happened by accident, where they helped, and situations in which this uh, was done on purpose, in which they did not help. So this is the first experimental demonstration of altruistic helping behaviors uh, in, in chimpanzees. Um, and so we have done a bunch of studies along these lines showing that um, chimpanzees do that even without a reward, whether you give them a reward or not actually has zero effect uh, on, on their helping. Um, but what you might uh, ask is, of course, to what extent is this actually true when you um, have a situation where a chimpanzee is not helping a human caregiver who feeds them and so forth, um, but someone um, who is also a chimpanzee. So what we um, tried to do is we wanted to elicit, so you can't really tell a chimpanzee how to follow an experimental protocol. Um, so what we did is we put a recipient chimpanzee in this room here. Um, and the problem was that when the recipient was trying to open a sliding door, this was not possible because it was blocked by a chain. And what now was necessary was that the subject would release this chain. This is like a peg between the bars, and when you turn it, it sl slips out. The chain drops, and the recipient can open the sliding door. And so we contrasted um, a situation um, in which we in, uh, uh, elicited this behavior by putting food into the target room um, con and contrasted this with a situation, a control condition, where uh, the recipient would ignore this door and try to open this one, but here, um, releasing that peg over there obviously makes no sense, uh, and this peg could not be reached by either one, okay? And I'll show you um, the brief clip here. So this is the, the setup, the recipient trying to open the door, and in a few seconds you will see the subject appearing on the right. Okay, and so what we found was that, as a matter of fact, um, we found a significant difference between the experimental and the control conditions so, and other baseline conditions, showing that chimpanzees uh, release the peg only when it helps the other, but not when it, it makes no, no sense. So this demonstrates that also chimpanzees are motivated to, to help, and they help conspecifics, and they help them even in a novel situation, once again showing that they also have some flexibility uh, in their helping. And so, um, when I want to contrast this with um, other results, so there are a bunch of studies I have to point out that did not show any helping or, or altruistic behaviors that were all related to um, giving food to others. So chimpanzees are not really good at sharing food. However, when it comes to this instrumental helping, uh, we and others have found consistently that chimpanzees have this tendency uh, to help others, which indicates to us that um, they do this perform this behavior to some extent as well. So here my last slide. What uh, I wanted to show you here is that um, we can see that these um, uh, helping behaviors go deep um, both into ontogeny, because um, young, human children appear to have a natural tendency to altruistically uh, help others, and they show the, these behaviors before social mechanisms, such as the internalization of culture and norms, could have had a major impact uh, on their development. But we are not alone in this regard, because crucial aspects of these altruistic behaviors seem to be apparent also in one of our closest evolutionary uh, relatives, 
indicating that um, these behaviors have deep evolutionary roots. And so when we go back to the question about the relationship between biological and uh, cultural factors for altruism, I would say that um, socialization can build upon our um, predisposition to not always be selfish, but be altruistic under some circumstances. So while cultural factors obviously play a major role, I think they can rather facilitate and sustain um, these altruistic tendencies rather than, uh, rather than implanting them in the human psyche in the first place. So with this, I want to conclude and also thank all my many collaborators and the research assistants who help with this and all the people uh, or an organization who funded uh, my research. Thank you very much. Should I black it? Don't worry about it. All right. All right. Well, um, first of all, I'd like to thank you, our three speakers. Uh, Felix, Mike, and, and James for their terrific presentation, for also for respecting the time uh, allocated to them, more or less. Um, and so we have about 45 minutes left for uh, questions and discussion. Uh, before I open it to the audience, um, I, I noticed that uh, James was nodding a lot. Uh, Mike is frantically taking notes. Um, so I'm sure they have a lot of questions for each other, and I think that's probably the best way to, to start. Um, but I, uh, as a way, probably sort of breaking the ice, I'm going to start with a very quick uh, question that it's for any of you. And I'm actually going to quote um, uh, Felix. In one of his papers, he, he says, the child starts out, and I think he just also mentioned this, the child starts out as an indiscriminate altruist. Uh, you know, at 14 months, right? We've seen it. They help, they help strangers. I, I, do, I believe that he was not your son, the child in the video. So uh, it was, you were a stranger for the, for the, for yeah, the yeah, child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, so, I don't have uh, that many children. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So if the child indeed starts out as an indiscriminate altruist, my question is, you know, we see that we quickly learn to label others, to divide them into categories and exclude them from our, you know, uh, moral community of, of a community of concern. James was um, mentioning this, Zimbardo's work, the humanization was mentioned yesterday as, as in all of this. You mentioned some of the work by Avenanti with the, with the very little response and even at the brain with brain imaging through the pain of others if these others are categorized as alt groups, as it was mentioned before. So what, what, what can we do? Can compassion help? Can inductive parenting help? Uh, all of you have written or, or talked about this, so I, I would like to um, you know, have your um, opinion and insights of uh, what can we do about this? We start out so well and then <laughs> it's all down the hill. Exactly, exactly. Well, okay, let me, let me uh, maybe start with the uh, let's do it ontogenetically and start with uh, children. So, um, so the, um, the working hypothesis that we have at the moment is exactly like you said, that um, children might be um, somewhat naive altruists early on, so that they would blindly help others, not really thinking about the other being a reciprocator, like what Michael said, it's very important that you be able to distinguish between those individuals who just screw you over and those individuals who might reciprocate the favor, your, the favor in the future. And so the claim is that uh, maybe children have this um, um, inclination to indiscriminately help, but then they have to learn or there's some other mechanism that comes into play somewhat later in development to differentiate between um, cooperators and defectors. Um, and so this is something that, that needs to happen at some point. Otherwise, um, as we know, uh, altruistic inclinations could not survive by, by natural selection. So this is something that um, has to happen over, over ontogeny. But the point is that, um, uh, like what James pointed out, is that um, there is an ontogeny in the first place, right? So this is, is a long process um, to, to grow into an altruistic being. And so for the one thing that you can learn over development or what matures over development is this ability um, to identify when um, should I be altruistic? When is there a problem? Um, and this might be driven by uh, compassion or, or goal understanding and so forth. But the other thing is also that you have to have these safety devices that you dif differentiate between um, those who might not be nice to you in the future and those who, who, who will be. And so I think um, 
and there is this, this tension between these two things that you, on the one hand you have to be uh, cooperative, but on the other hand you also have to be careful not to be exploited. And so I think these two things uh, have to come together. Empirically, um, there's a lot of exciting research uh, going on at the moment that is really um, uh, addressing this. I mean, so several people are investigating um, and this. Um, Kristen Dunfield uh, has done several studies along these lines um, looking at children um, being more, able, uh, more willing to to help those who were nice to them over uh, those who were not nice to, to them. Or uh, at Yale, uh, Karen Wynn has done several uh, studies indicating that children very early on can uh, differentiate between helpers and hinderers even in a third party context so they, they can identify who was nice to others over those who were not nice to others and then prefer those that were nice to others, maybe, maybe uh, realizing that they will also be nice to them and so forth. So, so there's a lot of uh, stuff uh, going on at the moment to look at the uh, ontogeny uh, of that. Thanks, Felix. James? Well, I, I would suggest that at least initially our default mode is to be cooperative and kind. Uh, with the caveats that uh, Felix uh, said in regard to, uh, if you will, being screwed over by others and then uh, uh, acting accordingly. Uh, you know, that being said, if, if you look at the, the studies that are being done in terms of, and the reason I say that our default mode is this, is if you look at the studies that are being done that show the physiologic effect of being compassionate or kind, as an example, <clears throat> stress is a manifestation, if you will, of threat or fear, and a lot of people have this. And this is when you revert back to this sort of primitive response. And uh, studies are now showing that we can actually have an effect on that fear response, if you will, by certain types of intervention or compassion interventions. And I think that uh, uh, we have great capacity to respond to such interventions where we can actually control our response to these types of threat. And uh, I think it can have profound benefit in terms of, uh, if you will, our happiness. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, this whole field, I think, is still in its embryonic stage, but there is every bit of evidence that uh, we can intervene uh, with ourselves. Uh, and I'll just give you one personal example. Uh, uh, I had sort of alluded briefly to my past. Uh, I grew up in poverty and uh, uh, my father was an alcoholic, my mother was an invalid, nobody in my family went to college. And you know, when you grow up in an environment like that, you know, it, this is one of daily despair, right? I mean, it's, uh, you don't look forward to uh, the sun rising. <clears throat> and when I was 13, I actually, uh, interestingly enough, walked into a magic shop and uh, uh, the owner wasn't there, but his mother was there. And at that point in my life, you know, I, I had despair, I was unhappy, I did not see you know, the possibility of po positive prospects. But this person took the time to intervene, if you will, and she said to me, if you come here every day for the next six weeks and spend time with me, I'll teach you something that I think could change your life. So I showed up, and that intervention involved, if you will, a mindfulness meditation practice in conjunction with a compassion practice and a visualization technique. And that intervention itself resulted in my own perspective, if you will, changing from one of no possibilities, if you will, to unlimited possibilities. And the, the reason I bring this up is that I think well, my situation may be potentially an extreme example. I think, though, that this potential exists to give people insights and abilities to change how they view their world. And, uh, and I think we are seeing the neuroscience of this uh, exemplified by uh, effects in our reward centers, uh, by seeing, as I alluded to, this volunteerism and its effect on longevity and in fact, just general happiness. So I think we're at the start of this, and of course, intuitively, we would all say, geez, if you're kind, uh, that's a good thing. But I think we're now seeing the neuroscience to support this. I'll just pile on. I, I, I think it would be a mistake to characterize human nature as somehow um, 
disinclined to cooperate. I, I, I think just the opposite, actually. Uh, you, you have to remember that, that the worlds that we live in are, are, are worlds that really are in some ways very different from the worlds that we're, our, our, our brains are, are well suited to living in. I mean, you, you imagine a world in which everyone that matters to you is going to know you for your entire life, right? And see you daily for your entire life. That's, that's the world we're well suited for. Uh, it's also a world where a child is going to need about a million calories of subsidy from other individuals in its life to, before it can get to the point where it can feed itself every day. That's very unlike, that is actually very unlike chimpanzees. Uh, chimpanzees are able to start eating for themselves and finding their own food really early, but children are daily caloric debtors for a, a decade and a half. And it's not just mom, actually, that's, that's doing the subsidizing. And it's not just dad. It's a lot of different relatives in their lives. Um, children, uh, men have not paid back that debt until, until they get into their 30s. Right? So, you know, think about that. So our life history. Just men, just men. Yeah, well, to be, to be completely forthright, women actually never pay it back <laughs> because of the difference in their foraging. They, they just never get those calories back out of their environments. That's, that, is, that is how our, our lives work. We, are subsid we subsidize each other in, in powerful ways. So for the human life history to work, the, the way we are well suited to making a living out of our environments, it's this, this idea of, you know, again, you know, um, this, this in individual that, that Robert Bella, you know, or Tocqueville criticized as this American individualist. That, that really isn't who we are. We don't make our worlds, our worlds don't work without heavy, you know, deep, concrete involvement uh, from, from others throughout the, throughout the life course. Um, I'll, I want to just tell this one story because I, I just love it so much. Um, Kim Hill, a, a, a biologist who studies the Aceh in Paraguay, told me this story. And I think it's, it's just such a delightful story to give you a sense of what the hunter-gatherer psychology is like. So he works in Paraguay. One day decided to leave the jungle with a man uh, from this, this, this uh, hunter-gatherer, light, light agriculturally, economically based society. And he said, I have to go in town. The guy had never been to town. Why don't you come with me? I'll take you and I need to buy some things and we'll, we'll walk around. I'll show you the city. I don't know what the city was, but he was you know, buying supplies. And he said, well, stop and we'll get a hamburger. Um, and, you know, after, after we've walked around for a while. So uh, Kim gives the guy $50 and he says, or whatever the currency was, and he says, just buy what you want. He just wanted to see what the guy would buy with his money. So they get into town and uh, uh, Kim is off buying some supplies or doing something, dealing with his passport. And he, you know, comes out a couple of hours later and finds his friend and, and he says, I'm hungry. Why don't we get something to eat? And his friend says, and so he says to his friend, you know, can, can I have some of the money back so I can go get us some food? And, and the, the guy says, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I gave it away pretty much as soon as we got into town. And he said, I saw a guy on the side of the road who looked sick. He looked, re I mean, I, I was astonished that nobody was taking care of him, so I gave him all the money, okay? That is the hunter-gatherer psychology. That is what it looks like. It's inconceivable to them that there would be people on the side of the road with no one who loves them, right? So, so that's, that's the biological hardware we have in our heads. That's what it looks like, and that's how it operates. And I would just say this begs the question. I, you know, I, I think it's acknowledged that our DNA really has not significantly changed in the last 100,000 years, which is the development of this hunter-gatherer society. And, uh, uh, you know, in that society, as was pointed out, you cannot hide. You cannot hide your pain. You cannot hide your suffering. And there's immediate uh, response to that. And additionally, because that society is so small, you have certain moral responsibilities to that society because that puts society at risk if you don't do it. So you have this sort of immediate uh, uh, response in that situation, and that's really what we're made for. And when you are soothed, when you're suffering immediately in these types of societies, this keeps, if you will, our sympathetic <coughs> and our parasympathetic uh, uh, systems in check. Because, you know, when you're in our modern society, we are not in any way made for this society. And that is why there's so many people who, if you will, are quote-unquote stressed out. 
because they're in these hypervigilant modes where their sympathetic system is always uh, at play. And as a result, they're chronically releasing these hormones uh, such as cortisol and epinephrine and others, which on the, in, in a short-term basis, if you're on the savanna and you're a, uh, a zebra and you're being chased by a lion, you know, you run, those mechanisms kick in, and you either live or die. And if you live, it immediately comes down to baseline. In our society, so many people are hypervigilant. These systems are always kicked in. And in terms of long-term detrimental effect, it is profound. I mean, as an example, just in business, if you look at the cost of stress, it's two to $300 billion a year in terms of loss of productivity, absenteeism, and what some people call presenteeism. And, and in, it's just in general in our society. But what we do know is some of these interventions that I was describing can actually change this balance to bring you back to, if you will, the sense of calmness. Because when your parasympathetic nervous system is kicked in, you have a sense of cooperation, you have a sense of reaching out, you have a sense of calmness, your heart rate goes down, and all these deleterious hormones are at bay, if you will. And when we talk about the positive effects of these interventions or being compassionate altruistic, it is bringing you back to this baseline, alluding to this part. In a hunter-gatherer tribe, you know everybody. You cannot possibly look and see, if you will, your kin or those close to you suffer. You want to intervene, and this was the example because he didn't even understand how it's even possible where you would not do so. Right. Yeah. That is our baseline. Yeah, that's good. Well, on, on this very good baseline, I think I would like to open, uh, um, open the question to the audience. So we have two microphones on either side. I think you can just line up and we'll start um, here on the right. Hi. First, I just want to thank you, Michael, for um, that great picture of a woman's breast. I really appreciated it. <laughs> Um, it's rare to find positive pictures of women's breasts. Oh, thanks. I see a thank lot you. of ads in Times Square that right. are not that. Um, but, uh, you know, I think uh, I'm, a, um, I'm the director of communications for a large homeless services agency in the city. And um, I do a lot of, I develop a lot of content all day. Um, and so I, I just wanted you guys to know that I appreciate this because it's where the rubber meets the road. You know, I go tomorrow and employ it in an email strategy or in a volunteer um, onboarding. Um, and, and so it does make a difference, um, not just in, in your academic circles, but in how we on the ground are working with people. Um, but you know what? Um, somebody said, I can't remember now, um, that it's, an, it's a field in its infancy. And I think it's important to actually embed it in its history. Um, because, you know, from my experience, a lot of this actually came out of um, the, the Holocaust. When it ended and um, Hannah Arendt wrote Eichmann in Jerusalem, you saw a huge response. Um, she even corresponded with Milgram when Milgram did the experiments, and then Zimbardo responding to that. Um, and, and so there was really this, and, and actually in some of my work, um, like Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, this whole, whole growth of positive psychology for him came out of his experiences leaving Hungary and having half of his family um, killed as the intelligentsia. Um, he was literally on the last um, uh, convoy leaving as the bridge blew up behind him and his wealthy um, you know, intelligentsia family all starved. Um, and that drove him into the field of positive psychology. And so when I look at it, I actually see this trajectory of not just caring for the needs of strangers came about because we wonder, well, why did people help people? And why did this evil happen? And so people started asking questions and employing um, strategies uh, and um, academic disciplines in a way they hadn't before. Um, and, and so to counter a little bit of the Zimbardo love, um, you know, I, I'm a big fan. I don't know if you've read Riker and Haslam's work on the BBC prison study, um, but it's really under, it, they really debunked a lot of what Zimbardo found. Um, they make an argument that Zimbardo shut down the ability um, for decades to really study this subsuming to an evil leader theory. And what they found when they were able to do the BBC prison studies was a lot about, um, in fact, uh, you know, Hannah, and they even went back to Hannah Arendt, she actually didn't stay long enough to understand um, what was really going on. If you follow the trials to the end, you in fact see that a lot of the um, Nazi leaders were in fact creatively um, employing the directive they were given. They were not subsuming. 
Um, and so what they found in their study was um, a lot of things, I think, for somewhat by what you said, Michael, um, this idea of permeability, in-group versus out-group um, and kin. So, uh, you know, when, when the study said that nobody could move beyond uh, uh, in-group versus out-group, uh, at the beginning it was permeable and people acted very differently. As soon as it was impermeable, they um, completely changed their behavior. Um, and, uh, but, the, but there are a number of findings from it that, for me, really says we need to change the way we're approaching um, the strategies that we use, like I said, on the ground, um, because I don't think that Zimbardo holds anymore. I think that there's a lot of new knowledge that um, we can use to not just care for the needs of strangers, and in a lot of ways that is actually stopping evil. Um, so what are we doing to, to empower people to not just care for the needs of strangers, but to stop evil? Um, it's not really a question, I'm sorry. Um, but, but Thank you. <laughs> it's very eloquent, but I would like to remind everybody to just be maybe more more synthetic in your questions, so we can you know hear from many of you. But thank you very much. I think you. I, I guess it's have a question. <laughs> can I ask my question? It is a question. All right. Um, you've talked about the hardwiring for the cooperation. Can you speak to the hardwiring for, is there evidence of hardwiring for punishing people who violate group norms, uh, for the pleasure centers getting activated by um, administering uh, whatever to people who are doing the wrong thing? Well, uh, uh, unfortunately, it may have seemed that there was this statement, or the statement was, I think, made that, yes, you, your pleasure centers light up when you're altruistic, but there was a study that was done that showed in bullies, their pleasure centers light up when they're bullies. So this is not to imply that, you know, uh, people cannot derive pleasure from being evil, if you will, or doing inappropriate things, and also uh, that uh, uh, We've seen in some of the neuroeconomic studies that, like with the prisoner's dilemma, uh, that, yeah, th th there is group punishment for people who fall outside what is quote-unquote acceptable behavior, and this has been demonstrated over and over again, if the ability, ha if the people have an ability to punish the other. As an example, if I recall the study correctly, you would be, you could give away money to others, and there are people who did that, uh, and you would be rewarded for doing that. But people would actually punish somebody who did not act accordingly or within this norm at their own expense. So they would actually lose by doing that. And I think this has been shown, that people want to punish others who are not, if you will, falling with what we would consider social norms. Yeah, yeah I, um, the study of punishment is, is part of my moonlighting job, I guess. Um, we, a lot of our, a lot of the experiments we're currently running are, are on, on punishment, and I mean one of the one of the surprising things for I think the whole field of evolutionary biology from um, the study of nitrogen fixing bacteria and and their symbionts who who need nitrogen uh, all the way up to humans is that punishment is really important for making cooperation happen uh, because it's it's something you always have in your back pocket to reduce the to uh, to put to pay, uh, pay make uh, cheaters pay a tax, right? So co uh, so punishment turns out to be a very effective mechanism for uh, enforcing cooperative interaction. Um, this is true in in cleaner fish mutualisms where tiny little fish clean the parasites off of bigger fish at these stations in you know in in reefs. Um, it's it's uh, sometimes those cleaner fish would actually prefer to be eat they. You would think what they want to eat is, is parasites off the, these large these large reef fish, but actually what they prefer to eat is mucus off of the outside of the fish's body. And, and really, who wouldn't? I mean, if you think about it. Uh, uh, so uh, occasionally, they they will actually take a bite out of these large fish, and um, when they do that, they get punished for it. And the punishment takes it reduces their feeding time. Um, and it forces them to go find another playmate for this cooperative interaction. And so, and, and cleaner fish actually learn when they're punished. So uh, the irony of, of punishment in many biological systems is that what it seems to be for is not destroying relationships, but res preserving them. 
preserving cooperative relationships. So that's one of the real ironic discoveries about the nature of punishment. I would say the same about what we would call revenge or retaliation systems in humans. I mean, we don't really call it punishment, do we? We call it revenge or getting even with somebody. Uh, one of the functions we think it has uh, is to um, impose costs that reduce the profitability, profitability of being a bad guy and induce you to be a good guy. Uh, yes, uh, we're surrounded by opportunities to give, and and yet I think that there's a sense in which we are deprived of opportunities to give, and people seem to suffer from this. And I'll tell you why I think this, and then I wonder what you think. I've uh, noticed as a New Yorker for many, many years, there's nothing you can do to make a strange New Yorker happier than to give him directions. Because you approach a stranger, and they tense up a little bit, and then you say, but you know, is this north or south when they get off the train? And it's just like people are so happy to do that. <coughs> But I want to follow that by a second example of it. Uh, I'm no longer young, and I have had multiple times in the last few years when I can't walk very much or at all, and I have a cane, whatever. The degree to which people give me their seats and is in phenomenal, and the most outstanding thing is I have fallen on the street a number of times and everyone within sight rushes to me to get me up before I'm even ready to get up. And somehow that is a meaningful helping situation. And people, it's like a starving man seeing food when it happens. I just kind of wonder what you all would think about that. C could I ask a question and, and then um, like sort of pass the ball to, uh, to Jim? Because I have a question coming out of your question. Yeah. Uh, I, do you? I like what you presented about compassion as a, as a certain felt state that seems to motivate a desire to help. And then the idea that second you experience sort of this craving to help. And that really fits, I think, with, I mean, certainly my own experience. Even this morning, I, I'm, this is, I, I have a friend who's out of work. I'm sure you do too. It just occurred to me this morning that I know somebody he could talk to about just networking. And it was because he told me that he was struggling to still find a job. So I had this compassion, and then I realized there was this person I could introduce him to. I couldn't wait until it was early enough to call my friend, you know, on the phone to say, I, I want some, I've got someone I want you to meet. It felt like this irresistible urge to do something helpful. So I, want, so I wonder if it's the same, you know, experience you've been a recipient of, you know. Just, just a comment, I, I, and I, I give this example sometimes. Every one of us in this room has suffered in some way, and every one of us in this room has been in a situation where either you were, in suffer you were suffering or you wanted something very badly, and you had exhausted every possibility of getting it. And when you're in that situation, how do you feel? You feel isolated, you feel alone, you feel unloved, oftentimes you feel there's no God, you feel that uh, somehow you're unworthy and this is why this is happening to you. And when somebody intervenes, what happens to you in a microsecond? God exists again, right? Uh, uh, or whatever you're believing in this week. But, but uh, uh, yeah, your whole worldview instantaneously changes when somebody intervenes when you are at that lowest state and suddenly the clouds part, you believe in God. Now think of the example when you yourself have actually seen somebody suffering in that way, and it could be even a small gesture, but you have intervened, and what do you feel? You know, we all feel something good when we get like a present or we buy something, but that's very, very short-lived. But think of the times where you have had an impact on somebody's life, where you have intervened, even at a small level, and how does that stay with you? It doesn't stay with you a minute or an hour. For many people, you can recall this event years later, and every time you recall it, you have this deep, deep sense of warmth and caring and concern. And that fundamentally is connecting with really what I think we're here for. You know, uh, without getting too metaphysical, which I sometimes do, even though I'm a neurosurgeon, but uh, you know, what is it that we all want at the end of the day? We want uh, transcendence. What is transcendence? 
We want to know we have a place in this world. We want to know our existence had purpose. And this feeling of transcendence, where we had an impact, that we were here for a reason, manifestly has to be connecting with others and serving others. It has to be, because that's how you, set, you get this type of feeling. And, and so I, I just simply give that as an example. But I thought the disjuncture between that and giving to the community chest. Well, you know, I think it gets back, we talked about authenticity of giving. You know, you have to define what your purpose is. You know, there are a number of people, extraordinarily wealthy people. In fact, I was with a billionaire who, I won't go into all the details, but uh, he had given $40 million to um, a university. And I, and, I, and I was trying to get him to give money for a medical device that would save hundreds of thousands of lives. And because his daughter had actually been treated with this device, I thought it would have an impact. And do you know what he said to me? He said, do you think I really give a shit about giving this money to the university or, or to help people? I had to have a tax donation, and it made me look good. Now, can you imagine? Right up front. Uh, uh, and this is how some people think. But can you imagine the complete lack of any care or concern whatsoever? So in that context, he doesn't receive any of the benefit of caring for others. Yet a simple act, if you do just thank somebody who, let's say, is serving you, or you reach out and give somebody change to go somewhere, these actually have a very positive effect on you. And when you do that, it stays with you and you reap those benefits, in fact. The, the timing of that question actually couldn't have been more perfect. Um, my question is about that feeling, that, that positive feeling that we get when we, when we give or when we help someone, um, especially someone very close by or someone that we, that we know. Um, and I'm, I'm curious if you think, um, it, it seems that it could be two things, either just gen genuine selflessness that we enjoy helping others, we enjoy seeing others that we that we care about, or even strangers um, thrive and, and be happy. Or could it could it also be that we enjoy being appreciated, or we enjoy the, the, the gratitude of others, or even that that re that reflection or image of ourself um, that that looks very positive when we help others? Is it is it could it be more selfish? <laughs> I guess. Well, you, you know, I, I had this conversation with the Dalai Lama. And uh, not that I'm t being a name dropper, but uh, <laughs> but but, but uh, you know he said uh, this is the only situation he can think of where it's okay to be selfish, because when you do these acts, you're actually really completely benefiting yourself, and the more you do, the more you benefit yourself, and the better you feel. And I think it's all of the reasons uh, you said. Now the uh, the other question I asked him though was. Does intent matter? Okay, and and, and he, he said, well, it doesn't matter because if the product of that is an example, this billionaire giving $40 million, he may not personally have cared, but the effect of it was incredibly good, wasn't it? I mean, it had a profound effect at this university. And I said, oh, well, that's interesting. Not, okay. And then he looked at me and says, unless you're a Buddhist, because then you have karma, right? <laughs> can I, can I add to that? Um, so, so, I mean, um, there are a lot of studies that address that and, um, uh, by trying to remove any possibility of reciprocation and so forth, mm -hmm. so, so that it happens anonymously, that um, you don't know who the other person is you're giving the money to, so, um, and therefore the person will also not know who you are and so forth, and it seems like people do get a kick out of that as mm -hmm. well. So, so it, there are several studies where um, it's shown that, for example, when you um, get a, a, a gift certificate for go, um, inviting someone to go to Starbucks rather than um, just getting coffee yourself, um, it seems to be more rewarding to, to, to the, the former, which is maybe confounded with what you pointed out, right? That th there's this act of giving, but maybe there's also that you, you get, get something back from the other individual. So that is certainly the case that this happens. But it seems also to be, to be the case in these situations where um, um, it, it, it cannot be acknowledged by, by anyone and um, still people seem to find that self-rewarding. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, just a comment. I think that um, one ought to at least acknowledge the fact that the United States is relatively unique in constructing a legal situation 
which allows for that donor to give 40 million and get the tax write off. So it creates a structural legal situation which then benefits a third party while benefiting the person who gave without any, any sort of emotion on the part of the giver. Um, so it's perhaps not a bad thing. But my questions go, um, I think what I would say to um, some of the more difficult aspects of all of this. Um, and one has to do with what you've been defining as cooperation, uh, specifically the example of the cleaner fish. But um, when I listen to you describe that situation, and then I, I don't follow the whole field, but um, I dipped into it at times, so I'm thinking of Amos Sahavi's work on the handicap principle. It seems to me that you might describe the same situation as one that enforces hierarchy and then reminds the cleaner fish that it's actually not part just of a cooperative effort, but it's part of a hierarchy. Uh, and it has a place to retain in that. And I think that um, it is a reality of giving structures that while they exist and they um, perhaps respond to and are derived from um, a biological impetus that um, at least in a social world and perhaps also in a biological world is not my field, they exist as part of a hierarchy and they exist to preserve and maintain hierarchies which then work to preserve a whole system of beings. Um, so that's one question. And I have a very quick question for Felix and that is all of your 18 month olds, okay, who are they? I mean, do they represent a spectrum of 18 month olds in terms of the first 18 months of their experience in life? And this was reinforced to me by Jim Doty's discuss, description of his own early life. I mean, you learned at some point, you had an experience which said to you, it can be different, and here's a way of being different, and here's a way of being generous, okay? So I wonder to what extent all those 18-month-olds look pretty well fed, pretty well clothed, pretty happy, there was a parent there. Do you have any sense in experimental terms of what happens if you take 18 months olds from an orphanage, from an orphanage in the US and an orphanage in Romania or Russia, some of which we've seen, or in North Korea. Um, what, I mean, how much of what you're seeing do you think might actually also be part of not only nature, but the nurture of the first 18 months, which is stable, predictable, safe, warm, well-fed, and all of those things. So I, I really wonder about that. No, of course, I mean, there's always nature and nurture, but the point is that we are studying children that grow up in the expected environment, right? And that would be a nurturing environment. So, so children growing up in orphanages, is, this is not what our uh, organism is designed for. So, so even if it is the case that, um, the, you, obviously you need the, this environment, this nurturing environment to, to grow up in this way. Uh, so th that's certainly the case. And so um, it is very well possible that it can be destroyed, but um, this would be by something that is not the, n the natural environment um, that, that people grow need, up in. But do we understand experimentally that you do need the, that nurturing 18 months to invoke these re evoke these responses? So, I so, wonder experimentally whether you've yeah, looked at that. Right, I mean, it would, it would be a really exciting study, and I hope that this would be, be done. I mean, it's very uh, uh, difficult to get access to the, um, these, these orphanages and so forth, but, but that's, a, that's an important question for future research to, to see to what extent um, this holds across a, a variety of populations. So I just want to point out, we, we have done studies this with uh, my colleague Tara Callaghan, who went to Peru and India and, and studied also children in, in modern Canada, um, to, to see to what extent they show these behaviors and there was no age difference. So, so at this, all these toddlers um, dis display these uh, helping behaviors. So it seemed to us that the, the, the basis is there um, even if you grow up in a, a small um, Indian village and so forth. And so maybe we should expect that maybe there are differences over development depending on the culture, but the, the basic skills seem to, to to be there. And so, yeah, that's an important question for, for future research, to what extent this um, is um, 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 uh, varies uh, inter-individually. So there's one component is what you're talking about is that there might be population differences or experience differences, but there are other inter-individual differences that, that could might, might occur and we don't know about that yet. So the kinds of studies that I um, talk about are really experimental studies 
um, where we try to do an existence proof and um, rule out certain counter hypotheses, but it's not a design to explain some of these inter individual differences which might, which might very well exist. Um, and one thing, for example, that we know with prosocial behavior in toddlerhood is that, for example, not in, in these helping behaviors, but empathy-based one, comforting behaviors, that, for example, children who are insecurely attached are not quite as, um, uh, as, uh, as willing or able to, to um, uh, comfort others. So, so there you can maybe um, see already individual differences very early on uh, in life. And I would just comment, if you saw one of the slides I showed, it talked about uh, uh, the effect of lack of attachment, right? And nurturing has profound, profound uh, effects on future health, future mental well-being. And uh, I, I think, I don't, I'm not sure if you even need to do that experiment. I mean, we are living a laboratory uh, mm -hmm. of people who have not had appropriate nurturing and caring. As an example, look at our prison <coughs> system. Do you really believe that most of the people in prison in the United States, which has the highest prison population of any industrialized country, are there because they're evil people? These are people who are fundamentally there because of lack of <clears throat> caring and nurturing. They're not evil people. And this is the system that we have in this country. You know, on many levels, we're a great country, but you even look at childhood poverty. Childhood poverty manifests itself by lack of attachment oftentimes, and you simply follow that out over and over again to have these individuals uh, become adults and what happens to them. And again, as an industrialized country, we have one of the highest childhood poverty rates too. So these are huge, huge social issues that you talk about giving. You know, this is a, another manifestation. Who do we leave our children with? We're in a situation where parents are working two jobs, uh, children are somehow supposed to be cared for by a system, a school system, and, and you have this whole population of young people who grow up without appropriate attachment, and then we're somehow shocked and surprised uh, of the outcome. Yeah, I mean, I think I'll briefly follow up on that. I think I agree with James that we may not need these experiments because uh, the research on attachment has shown, you know, that, that um, uh, lack of care, you know, emotional care, warmth, and, and support over the, you know, in the early years of life it can be a very detrimental. Attachment is related to helping behavior, so you know, it all makes sense. And actually early studies from the 1920s in the, um, uh, in the United States show that children who did not receive that kind of care, although they were properly taken care of from a, from a physical standpoint and fed, the, the mortality rate was, was um, incredibly high just because they were not touched and, and, and held. So I think you know, we have a lot of evidence already in support of this. Do you know what's actually fascinating? Even among adults, a survey has shown that 25% of people, if asked, will tell you that they feel that they have no one to turn to when they're in pain or suffering. I mean, what does that tell us about our society? You know, I mean, there are people who work in jobs every day, yet for some reason they do not feel that either they can turn to the person next to them and say, you know, geez, I'm, I'm in pain today as a human being and expect to get something, some care and nurturing. I mean, there are people who work in cubicles next to each other who don't know the, who only know the most superficial thing about the person. And the problem is we are so afraid of showing our vulnerability and our fragility to others because we don't have this little hunter-gatherer tribe that just accepts us and sees us who we are. We carry this mask around <clears throat> that somehow hides our vulnerability, and as a result, we are afraid to be vulnerable ourselves. And I will tell you, almost every time I give a talk, and I give one on compassion and caring, uh, and it, it, a lot of it involves examples of children I've taken care of who subsequently died. And you know, this is heart rendering. And sometimes I break up. As soon as I do that, everyone in the room starts crying. Isn't that amazing? All they've asked for is permission to open their heart. And people almost invariably do it. You just have to be vulnerable. All right, so that is a good sign that you know, discussions are going very well, but I have to keep track of time. So I'd ask you, maybe we're gonna take the three questions, the remaining question at once. Uh, I'll ask you to be very brief so we can conclude because we start again at 4.30. We are supposed to finish at four and start again at 4.30. So we'll take the, the two remaining questions and then we'll get answers at once. Three, Thank you. Three. Okay. Uh, I'm Michael Seltzer from the Baruch College School of Public Affairs. I've worked in the vineyard of, of philanthropy, of practice for 40 years. Uh, 
Dr. Dodi, I'd like to invite you to go back to one of your closing slides, and that is, how do we impart to the current generation of billionaires, millionaires in this city, a sense of responsibility or a sense of opportunity for our poor? I mean, let me finish just saying, we sit in a city, uh, we have 14% of the homeless of the entire country. We have the third highest uh, incidence of new cases of AIDS, HIV, and I can go on. We're also at the peak of accumulation of wealth, probably, and the extent of poverty, probably one of the peak in our history of our city. You are about to tell us what we can, how do we teach a new generation? I guess we're going back to who you had dinner with. Maybe he's a lost cause. But for those who are left in this vineyard, what can we do to inculcate that spirit? Yeah, you know, uh, I deal with this uh, every day. You know, and, and it's interesting because when I gave my money away, I just gave it away. I, I really didn't have second thought. And it, it, I spent a lot of time with extraordinarily wealthy people trying to pry money out of their hands. And I, I, I feel so bad sometimes because, you know, what a lot of these people, you know, there's, and I'm, I will tell you I'm not a Buddhist, but uh, there's a thing in Tibetan, in fact, I'm an atheist, but there's a Tibetan cosmology that says, you know, there's a, the hungry ghost. You know, people are trying to fill this emptiness inside themselves with something that offers no sustenance. And they go around and acquire and acquire. And they're so blind to this thing that's right in front of them, which we talked about, this incredible power of giving, yet breaking through this very, very thick, you know, steel wall to get to them. Plus, there are a couple other issues. You know, there's work by a guy named Michael Krauss, I think, that talks about socioeconomic class. And people of higher socioeconomic class don't have the same ability to gauge people's emotions or the fact that they're suffering. Mm -hmm. You know, for most of us in this room, you have had to leave your, lead your life by cooperative behavior, otherwise you don't go anywhere. Well, if you have everything and you can bypass everything, you don't need anybody. And what happens, it dulls you to even see that other people are suffering. I, I mean, I was with just, uh, just a, a couple examples. I was just with somebody who's worth $100 million. And I go, Dr. I so love your work. My husband and I, we really want to, you know, we want to make a donation. $5,000. <laughs> now, what planet are you on, right? I mean, and she said, but we just want to be sure it's spent well. Oh, you, you know, and, and uh, um, another billionaire who uh, I was with, you know, he got down to the level of saying, well, you know, I think the rent you're talking about paying is $2 more a year per square foot than it should be. <laughs> yeah, and in the time it took him to talk, he probably made a couple million dollars, you know what I mean? And, and it, it, it really is extraordinary. I wish I had, I, I think, Unfortunately, until somebody is put in the position where they can understand what it's like to be at the other end of the thing, you know, when you wake up every day and, if you will, you're being shit on, you have great empathy for all the other people who are in that position. When you have never experienced yourself, and this is some, in some ways, can you blame them? I mean, this is not because some of them are evil. In fact, some of these people are suffering at an incredibly deep level. But if they've never had that experience or exposure, and I will tell you, if you can get some of these people out of their barricaded lives to actually get them to connect, they get it. But it's getting them out of that, and I think that's the real challenge. And I will tell you, it's not one I have successfully overcome yet. So, Thank you. Mr. Doughty, I wonder if you would talk a little bit about your compassion interventions. Is that something you're doing in your lab? And is there an end goal there? Is the hope to document these different types of interventions and publish papers and then hopefully have people in different sectors use them in, 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 in the secular context in which you work? Yes. Uh, uh, but uh, um, so it's not just us. There are a number of labs that are doing this. The group at Emory is doing it. Uh, Tanya Singer's group is doing it. And, and in fact, if we watch this work, it's actually growing exponentially. We are seeing how these certain types of interventions, almost all based on a mindfulness practice, 
uh, are having a, a positive impact. But the, the, the real goal is to improve people's lives. Uh, I will tell, and this course that we have, and, and many of them are modeled around basically an eight-week course. It's about two hours a week of didactic, <coughs> and then a half an hour or so a day of a practice. The, the effect this has on people is profound. And uh, I, you know, we are overflowing with, with applicants to this, and we're limited, actually. Hmm. Uh, so people really want this. Now, getting back to the other question that was asked, look at this room right here. Now, most of the people here are probably compassionate or interested. That's why they showed up. Where are the billionaires, right? Where are the extraordinarily affluent people? They're out having lunch at, uh, uh, you know, uh, wherever, uh, being driven around, and uh, they're just, this isn't even where their head is at because they don't see it. But, but uh, uh, one of the things that I will just mention at the end here is we're actually developing a compassion gymnasium, which is an online thing, because like a muscle, we do know that compassionate behavior and the positive effects can be built up and like a muscle, stay strong and as long as you keep doing it. So that's another thing we're doing. Thank you. We'll take the last question. Thank you. I think I'll, I'll try to make it brief. Thank you. Um, I guess when I watched the uh, re you know, research on, um, on children, it's obviously remarkable to see you know, genuine empathy in uh, you know, just seeing it is different from talking about it a lot. Um, and, but I, I guess maybe I'm a bit of a morbid person, but I, I was reminded of like, uh, Algis Huxley's A Brave New World where, um, and like the you know, death conditioning um, where you know, it, it loses the, some, some kind of genuine, human, authentic um, experience. So my question is, with, with the potential to use research for teaching empathy and altruism, are there any dangers in creating similar environment, you know, controlled environments where there are, um, you could potentially lose that authentic or organic element of human engagement, um, where it, some of these practice behaviors are somehow dehumanized or um, especially when you're dealing with so like ele elementary education, you're teaching children empathy, so. Yes, <laughs> and, the, um, and how you can destroy it is by rewarding. So, so that's, a, that's a finding, so this is called um, the over-justification effect or uh, crowding out in behavioral economics. So that when there is a behavior that's in intrinsically rewarding, uh, when then you uh, give incentives, you destroy the intrinsic motivation and people don't engage in it uh, anymore. And this has been demonstrated in a lot of um, domains. This is like if you are motivated to learn and then you get a reward for it and you do it only for the grade, it will in the long term have a negative effect. Or there are studies um, showing that like f real life examples that um, people did not bring their children to daycare in time. So the policy was implemented that, okay, we should just uh, put up a fine. So every time you bring your child too late, or like, I don't know, every five minutes, it's a certain amount of money. Then what, what happened was that people brought their children uh, even later because it turned into an economic transaction. It was no longer something that they feel obligated to make this um, daycare work properly. But it, it says like, oh, well, it's just, three dollars um, if I bring my child 15 minutes late, so, so there's no problem anymore. And this stayed on, so the point was that even after they um, um, stopped this policy, um, they never returned back to normal. So, so this is another example, and then very concretely what um, I did uh, was a study with these um, toddlers where we rewarded the children for picking up objects that someone had dropped, and what we found was that um, children who had received a reward, if they later on were again in the same situation where no one offered a reward, these children were less likely to continue to help spontaneously than children who had never been rewarded for helping. So, so uh, yeah, that, that's, the, that's the answer. You can, can destroy that as long as we assume that at least certain types of altruistic behavior are intrinsically mo motivating. So if it is the case that people have this inclination to um, um, show people uh, where, where uh, Fifth Street is and where North and South is, um, and if you keep, um, if tourists now always pay New Yorkers for this service, it will disappear. I guess, I guess, thank, uh, you, thank you, okay. thank you very much. I, I would like to, uh, thank you again, our speakers, for the, um, for coming here, sharing uh, their, wind, their wisdom with us. For for no reward, <laughs> or, or very little.
And uh, of course, the audience for the library discussion. Um, we're taking a 25 minutes break and reconvene at 4.30 for the next section. Thank you.